get started now. For anyone who's coming in here, so the print schedule, we were a last minute replacement for whitehouse.gov. So if you are coming in for that, don't leave because I'm going to be talking a little bit about open government. Um, uh, but also other cool 3D things. So, um, so we're going to talk to you today about how you can use uh, this X3D and X3DM 3D graphics uh, to add interactive 3D content to your Drupal site. Um, and I'm going to use an example of the NIH 3D Print Exchange. So um, my name is Megan Coakley. I am an analyst at the Bioinformatics and Computational Biosciences Branch of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology, um, which is really just a fancy name for being the scientific arm of the IT department. Um, of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, and then my co-presenter here, Leonard Daly, um, is the president of Daly Realism and is a board member on the Web3D Consortium, which we're also a part of at NIH. Um, so because this is in the showcase track, I'm gonna talk about a couple different things involving Drupal, just some unique stuff that we did with the site. I don't wanna get into too much of our scientific stuff, but if you are a science geek, hopefully, uh, like me, hopefully you'll, you'll get some good stuff out of it. So, um, oh, sorry. Oop. Okay, um, so, we'll move on. So before I launch into that, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, 3D printing itself, just so you kind of have a context for where I'm going with this. So um, 3D printing is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a means of fabrication that involves um, putting down layer, fabricating objects layer by layer in 3D. Um, and it's being, typically it, it, it evolved from industry and manufacturing and rapid prototyping. It's kind of an old technology. It's been around for 30, 20, 30 years or so, but it's only now becoming mainstream. You can print in all different kinds of materials. There's amazing uses for it. And it's kind of right now that it's moving into um, the biosciences and medicine being used in things like um, 3D printable prosthetics, um, surgical planning, printing out 3D prints for surgical planning, bioprinting is now the thing. And then, um, you know, it's, it's great as a scientific visualization tool. And, uh, and that's what, what we do at my institute. So um, talking about 3D visualization and why you're all here, um, a, a lot of what I'm gonna be saying is, is using scientific data as a reference point, because that's where I'm coming from, but all of the concepts and methods here, you know, can be applied in, in, uh, in any way, and of course, you know, with the, the Drupal specs. So we know that a picture is worth a thousand words, um, and I could spend far more than a thousand words telling you about this molecular structure, which is hemagglutinin, our receptor on the influenza virus, but um, there's only so much information you can gather from that. So here's the same model, model in a, a digital 3D and then a 3D print. Um, so there's, there's much more to be gained from that, that th this model actually, that, that 3D print itself, um, kind of caused a, was a critical turning point in a breakthrough discovery for researchers at NIAID um, who, uh, it, was, it was a discovery that's le leading towards a universal flu vaccine. So these can be really impactful in helping people when you get the physical object in your hands, there's things that you can see. Um, so we had great things happening at NIH, but how can we help the public benefit from that? So we created the NIH 3D Print Exchange, which is the site built in Drupal. Um, uh, and there are many kind of repositories to get 3D prints, like there's iPhone covers, gadgets, widgets, things like that. Um, but we wanted to be able to share things that are bioscientific and medical and that are accurate, and there's not a lot of that out there. So, um, and even to make those models requires a lot of um, experience with a lot of advanced software. For anyone who's familiar with 3D graphics, and hopefully many of you are, um, it's not that easy, and particularly to make something that's watertight in a 3D printable format that is compatible with a, a 3D printer. So the exchange was kind of our way of, of narrowing that knowledge gap. Um, and it's open and interactive. You can download anything. You can upload stuff. It's it's been a great resource. And the opportunity to do that, um, getting to the the government part, um, was through the HHS ID Lab. So NIH is under Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we got some seed funding from them, and uh, it was great because they encouraged us to use um, lean and agile development methods, which was a major change from the um, typical waterfall. Um, and enterprise performance life cycle stages, that kind of thing that we were used to. So that was really cool and it's, it's really transformed how we work. So if you're in government and you haven't gone that way, I would highly, uh, highly recommend that. 
So, um, and then a major part, so this is sort of our timeline. We actually had a public Drupal site up in less than eight months. Um, and we, we actually launched the site, uh, a public beta um, in April after starting development in November of 2013. Um, launched it April uh, 2014. And then the public uh, version, the, the initial public release was available in June 2014. But um, so the, so the government, uh, if, if you're not familiar with that, it's Drupal's being widely used in government. I think it's great because it's all open source. There's things that we can share. Um, the, uh, you know, it was HHS that suggested that we use that. Um, and hopefully, you know, bringing this open source stuff is saving us all a lot of taxpayer dollars. So um, OCRCB, the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, where I am, we have a lot of really talented developers and administrators, but we didn't have any experience with Drupal. So as a beginner, you know, anyone, I don't know if you felt this way, but it's kind of a weird beast. Um, so, and up until this project, we had worked almost exclusively in SharePoint um, for our internet, intranet, all our collaborative administration websites. So we had this really tight timeline. We were working in a completely new CMS. We had abandoned waterfall and we're doing this completely new development technique and it was, it was pretty crazy, but it was a great learning experience. Um, but uh, one of our developers one day asked us for the project requirements and we said, we don't know them yet. Because uh, there's never been a resource like this and he you know, was kind of, oh my God, you're breaking all the rules, you're making changes on production, what are you doing? Um, but breaking those rules, we um, were able to launch at the White House Maker Fair um, last June. So that was kind of a big, and in 11 months since that public launch, we have over 30,000, as of, yeah, I guess as of last month, we had over 30,000 unique site visitors, over 2,000 registered users, and uh, over 5,000 downloadable um, 3D models, 3D files that are compatible with 3D printers. So it's a community-driven database. So it's not just government stuff. Anyone can go there as a registered user. You can upload that file, um, medical models, labware, chemicals, molecules, um, anything related to science and medicine. So um, there's two main, so getting into the visualization part, there's two main file types used in 3D printing, stereolithography, which only, it doesn't have any color information, and then the virtual reality mo modeling language, VRML or VRML, and that does con to contain color. So because 3D printing has been mostly about functionality, this color aspect hasn't really been that important. So there are 3D graphics visualizers on the web, um, and even some in, uh, in Drupal, but we didn't really feel like they, they met all the requirements for us in being able to display these, these color models um, in, a, in a really, nice, accurate way, and they're kind of big files with something that's, that's robust and, and fast. Um, so, but the, but the color is essential in getting that, that extra information. So here's an example of, you know, what these standard, uh, it, this is actually, this is NASA's website. So this is the now famous wrench that they sent up to the space station. It was printed there. And they actually stream their 3D graphics um, from Git. So Git has a 3D viewer. Um, you know, and you can flip that around, turn it around. Um, uh, because if you're, if you're gonna print something in 3D, you wanna visualize it first. Um, so what we did, because we wanted color and, and we wanted something different and new, we turned to the X3D uh, file format. And Leonard's gonna kinda go into more of the, the technical specs on that. But it's a royalty-free, open standard file format. Um, and it's, it's actually a more um, mature uh, evolution of Vermal. So, uh, but it's not, it's actually not 3D, um, 3D printer compatible, there's just STL and Vermal mainly, but um, it's really easy. It runs in JavaScript and WebGL, um, so it will work on virtually any browser, um, and, and it's just kind of really simple, lightweight. So I'm going to actually do a, um, a live demo because it was just kind of, uh, I'll go to, just seemed a bit easier. All right, so here's the site. This is where you can go and search and filter and look at all these things. Um, let's see, bring this in. So this was actually just downloaded uh, last night or earlier today. So here's the, um, the, the preview image. I can click 3D here, and I'll get, this is all, um, 
doing this as part of the module. So the great thing about X3D is it has this compressed binary um, format that it allows to do this progressive loading. So you're not just sitting there waiting at a white screen and that's a new implementation, implementation to this site as of just a couple months ago and it's really um, enhanced the user experience. Um, so you can, in our little, uh, it's just an iframe uh, there and then you can launch a full screen viewer. Um, And again, so you get that faster loading and you can kind of go in and play around with it. And it's just a nice, whether, whether you're gonna actually have content like this that your user is gonna interact with, you can have you know, sort of a running animation. It's just one of those things to add a little bit of novelty. It doesn't have to be too flashy. So it's just kind of a nice thing that we, that we added. Um, so I'll come back if I can. Thank you, I figured that was gonna be a lot easier to do uh, a live demo. Uh, I was a bit risky with the wireless, but it's been good so far. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, X3D is not actually printable, and when people are uploading stuff, they're uploading an STL or a Vermal. So we actually turned Drupal from a content management system into a content creation system. And this is our really kind of the, the part that we were excited about that was really novel. Um, so those, these pipelines work. It's just a Python script that calls on um, a, a workflow to convert either the SDL or the Vermal to um, uh, an X3D format, and then it generates um, the PNG preview. Um, it's totally simple. It's done um, in Blender, which is um, uh, it's an open source version of Maya, which is a, a 3D graphics uh, application. So the other part of this, as I said, it, they're difficult to create. So how can we make this easier for people? So we made these create tools where you can click on this and upload your raw data. So you could go on there, for instance, get your CT scan from your doctor and actually um, upload that to the site and you can get out, you know, you can see the, the bones of it and print them if you wanted to. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, and uh, so and it takes a couple different, uh, 35 different file formats that range from microscopy image stocks, uh, protein structure data. So I won't get into this too much, but as an example, this is a, a protein, 3D protein structure data, which is essentially just a point cloud. It's just GPS coordinates for atoms. Um, and we have the more sophisticated workflow that uh, converts all of this into the 3D printable format. Um, and again, this was something our, our developers hadn't worked with Drupal. Um, he's, a, he's a Jedi master, he's awesome. And, and he said, you know, he was a little scared of Drupal at first and then he said, wow, this thing is really amazingly scriptable. That you can do so much more with it outside of just, um, you know, managing content. You can do all these incredible things and you could apply this, I'm sure, to many other types of file conversions or I don't, I don't know how many people are, are integrating these kind of backend workflows, but it uses all um, open source uh, applications. So that's what you get out of it with the protein structures. So it's actually from that one data file, we're creating 24 completely new uh, data files. So for instance, this pipeline spits out um, six, or six vermal in color, two STL, you have eight X3D for display, and then uh, eight PNGs for the previews. So we have a lot of memory um, storage there. So, uh, but, you know, so we did this, and the idea is that, um, you know, you can do this too. So actually, here we go. So the, the x 3 module that we built, so this kind of went into, that, that, that viewer went into a custom module that we had that was sort of our giant thing that runs all these workflows. And we took that out, put a scaled down version. It's in Sandbox now. And what it does is it just gives you um, a, a media image type in your content type. Uh, you have a field for X3D file, and then you can pick this X3D interactive viewer. Um, and actually, I don't know if Jamie is here. We had a boff yesterday, and he actually uploaded the module and got it working while we were right there. So, And if you need X3D files to practice with, we, of course, have loads on the site. So. Um, I, it's, it's in sandbox, but hopefully it'll be approved soon, and I certainly encourage everyone to try it out. So I'm gonna go to, Leonard, I'll go to you now, and he'll tell you more about the standard.
So as we're doing these switches, if anybody has any questions here for Megan, come up to the microphone up there so we can capture it on the recordings. We can take a couple of questions now if you have any. Also, for those people in the back, you may want to move forward. Some of the slides may have content that gets a little small. Not that it's critical that you see it right now. You can always capture the video and the slides are online. with sound effects. <laughs> so these are also slides I presented at the Bofflet yesterday. We're going to skip it. It's one combined deck. So the, the slides we skipped will be the more technical nature and dealing with more code. And this is more of the presentation of capabilities of X3D. So this is a complete overview of the slide set. We will be touching on about half of the topics. First off, what is X3D? And this is not going to be a course on how you create X3D. That's fairly involved. Uh, there are quite a number of content tools, such as Maya and Blender, which will create X3D. Also, most of the CAD tools will output X3D or Vermal and do that. So you're not needing to do this by hand. It's a rather extensive process. But when you're done, you do create scenes that are fully animated uh, involving rich media. Uh, in this case, it doesn't have audio, but it's fairly simple to add. This, this one has an animated camera, but with the controls over here in the top left, you can switch to a camera that is user controllable. Uh, this particular scene is nice because it's very visually rich and it will play for itself and it loops around so you don't need to continually uh, inter interact with it. Up in the top left, there's a counter showing the resources that are coming down. This is a live demo. Going on for a very slow internet right now, so we may not see the whole thing. Uh, but this is linked from the slides, so you can get to it. These examples are were all done by the developers in this, of X3DOM, which is a library produced by Fraunhofer. And we'll put this up later because it'll take too long. Web3D Consortium is the developer, is a standards development organization for the X3D standard. X3D is an ISO royalty free open standard. It's usable by anybody without having the need to pay for royalties to for any purpose involved in that. It will run in browsers, as you saw with that example. Uh, it also runs in standalone systems and in plugins. Uh, it runs on phones, tablets, desktops, laptops, and cave environments, and pretty much anything that can handle a WebGL or an open or DirectX type interface. Web3D Consortium talked about that. They, uh, their site is one of the example sites that I'll use for showing a simple plugin. 
the X, X3 DOM is X3D plus HTML5 plus JavaScript. It all runs in the browser, on the phones. Um, if you have any phone, you can go to a, uh, these slide sets and pick, pull up most of the examples. The really big ones, like the cathedral, take a lot longer and may crash your phone depending upon the particular uh, sophistication or capaci capacity of the phone. So the integration into HTML is fairly easy. It requires one external JavaScript, one external CSS, and some code. See there? And it just it just runs right in the, right in there in this simple example of a box that's uh, user controllable in terms of orientation. Anybody who attended the Angular JS talk just before lunch, they did talk about cores. I am not going to go into the details. There's details in the slides here for reference. You need to pull out the stuff, but it has the same issues that Angular does. So we'll cover three sim three integration methods. Megan talked about one, which is the Drupal module. Uh, this is in sandbox, not quite ready for production yet, but just about to be. Uh, there's the old traditional iframe method, which brings in anything external to the page, just drops it into a box you identify. And that's the case of this globe here. And this is just a, a screen capture, but in the website you can manipulate the goal, globe. It also goes to a separate application where you can get the, wet, the current weather for any point on the earth. The partial integration we'll spend most of the rest of the time on is involving moving the models so they're visualized on a phone. And the neat thing about that is that the phone there also can track motion. So as you reorient the phone, either by looking up, down, left, right, you can see different parts of the model. And we have to do this one. This was model was loaded up yesterday, day before. It's the flu virus. It's available. Uh, here, here's the URL. There's 15 to 20 models there. Um, many from the NIH. There's also another set of cl uh, collections of museum, uh, scanned museum objects. Uh, they're all visualizing on the phone. And then through another switch, which you see over here in the stereo view, on the phone, or actually in, in any environment, it will go and you'll see it go into split screen mode. And then using the very expensive device called Google Cardboard, and this runs between 5 and $15 depending upon the particular model, you will see this in stereo. If you remember the old Viewmaster slides where you click through and you got a pair of like seven, seven different views, this is essentially what this device is. But because you plug your phone right here, you get the full interaction that you would with the phone. So it rotates the model. You see it in stereoscopic views. Some models like the flu virus, which are particularly round, don't, you see the details. Other models that have large extents in one direction, but not necessarily the other one, will have a very pronounced 3D effect. And after the talk today, people can come up and use this and check it out with their phone, and look at the various models. So we're running early here, um, and I've pretty much finished my talk of the slides. So going back and picking up what we covered about the three integration methods, the inlines with the, uh, the iframe, a partial integration method into Drupal content, and you get the stereo viewing, and the, also the NIH Drupal module, plus then the NIH workflow Drupal as a content development system, content creation system. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, if anyone wants to come up and try the Google Cardboard, you're welcome to. But um, overall, I'll just, um, I won't go back to, see if I can go back to the acknowledgement slide. Um, here we go. 
So essentially, the, the crux of this is that everything is done open source, um, which I know being the Drupal community, you would all appreciate. It's all really simple, and I think you can see that there's, there's the opportunity there to provide a lot of rich content for your user base. Um, and as well, this, all of this openness means open government, so that's kind of exciting. Um, we actually, um, on our developer page, you'll find links to, we, we built an API actually with Squishy Media. Um, Greg Lunche was here earlier. Uh, he's a Squishy Media. Um, he was involved in organizing the conference, and we got a lot of help from 18F, which is part of the GSA, to get this API out there and, and just see what people are going to do with it, and we're kind of excited to see what they'll do with that. Um, the code for our pipelines is going to be up on GitHub soon. And then um, we will, and then there's the module. So we're really trying to put this out there. And actually, the entire site, because it's in Drupal, is completely transferable. So my goal was kind of, all right, well, let's get a 3D print.nist.gov and a 3D print.army.mil and, you know, see how it goes from there. So getting, you know, more return on your taxpayer dollars. Um, and, and one of our things we were excited about is we were written up, if anyone is aware of Ken Lane, the API evangelist, uh, gave us some great praise for, for and mainly for Squishy Media for making um, just a great, really easy to use API. So again, um, we'll have the slides up and there'll be links to the sandbox. You can just search sandbox x 3 dum and, uh, and you'll find it there. I encourage you to try it out. Um, and as I said, hopefully that'll be uh, approved, but it is working now. So we had someone test it yesterday here. They had it set up running really quickly. So um, we've got a small team that's around um, th from a couple different institutes uh, beyond mine at NIH. Um, we've really reached out to a lot of, there's so many people that we would have to thank for this, but um, s sort of that theme was getting, reaching out to sort of getting people to help you think outside the box. Um, and so there's our, our final thanks. And um, if anyone has any questions, certainly, or come on up and try the Google Cardboard. Well, as long as it, it should display in here. Oh, um, you have to, maybe you have to unlock it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unlock it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Start to full screen. Let's go to full screen. There's two links there. The, the picture takes you to mono. And there's also next to it mono and a stereo link. There's 
in Florenza for anybody who wants to take a look. Or if you would love to. Stereo is the five match. Yeah. It's like the, the stereo is like this. Which then you load into this thing. That's, that's in Florenza right there. Take it out of the case, it's just a little yeah. bit too thick for it to yeah. fit in. Well, the progressive, I, I think that one actually still, it doesn't break because it's a really nice one. Oh, it's so good. Really nice. But, um, but yeah, the one that you brought up was fine. Oh, I just, oh, I hate it. Uh, th those are kind of difficult to work edges, but the even the arc flipping is just so yeah. well. Like, it's like the very end. That's why it's always so good because it's just like you have to like, yeah. really visualize it because you want to read it. Because it's, but yeah, it's just really good. to turn around completely? No, but I'm saying it's not lining up the two. Uh, the, 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 the two the images, side by side. Yeah, side by side. Some, some phones isn't quite matching yet. Yes, it isn't. What kind of phone? Oh, you're not going to shoot. I'm 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 not going to shoot. There we go. Let's see if this is. Oh, yeah. in a browser. Mm. Let's see here, buddy. No plugins. There you go. Thank you. Sir, would you like to turn the phone? Yeah, but it's, it's not the stereo view. So this is the regular mono view. And then the other way around is oh, no. the long view. So while that's downloading, you can see it counting down there. Take a look at this one. This is uh, another biological one. As soon as yours is ready, we'll get that going. You may be seeing the, the pixels for the phone. To, uh, you may, uh, yeah. So this was made last year, and the phones, the design for this were phones that were a little bit smaller than they got.
just to make this real simple, because the Oculus Rift was selling for like fifteen hundred dollars, and this is fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> so if you want to, to illustrate this, and you want and you want to take it to Asia or Africa, you can't take a Rift because they're too expensive. You can't. But this one, yeah, okay, they're not cheap by their by their economic standards, but they're they're easy to take. They fold up flat like a CD mailing box. Yeah. Yeah. Punch. Or you can ship it easy. It ships in a nice box. You don't need special packing. You know, it's its own packing. Don't worry about damaging. Yeah. You know, the only really damage, you know, I lost that already, um, is the, uh, the lenses. Yeah. Well, it folds up. There's some glue tape here, so I can't unfold it. But in the... No, Velcro on top, but there's actually double stick tape. Um, the... When you get it, it's a box about this size and about that thick. Right. And really light. So, and it's, yeah. And so it makes it very easy. And if you need for education purposes, uh, for medical purposes, yeah. And, you know, and everybody's got a phone. And, and to run to run a Rift, you need a computer, a laptop, or a desktop. You know, pretty big one, too. Right. So it's, it's not it's a it's a major effort whereas this is, is very easy to do. You know, you, you, we can take it to shows like this, and if we lose it, yeah, un, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's not. But you're not losing a major thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's it makes it really nice. Um, the pattern for this is available for free online. No, no, it's, uh, the pattern is at Google. I need to put some links on it, yeah. But I, I do have some real links on the realism site from a couple of blog posts about that, but I, I should know. Some engineers at Google. So that, that's why I get nicknamed Google Cardboard, but there's also Dodo. Yeah, Dodo Case makes it, makes one. Um, Samsung has a Gear VR, which is all, though these are essentially the same. Really simple design, and to go from it's like they talk to IKEA to go from their flat package to the, to the final. And it's not even difficult to put together. It's, it's not too complex. I am uh, Leonard. Do you have a card? South Korea? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hong? How's that pronounced? Consortium has a Korea chapter. It might be very interesting for you guys. Can I go on the internet? Yes. I'm going to not click and list it because I will come on the reception. Yeah, I'll be around. I, we just have to leave this room because there's another presentation here, but we'll be around. Um, both Megan and I will be around for. Sure. No, okay, so the the printed presentation.
it's like a, it's like a, it's like a cheap virtual reality thing. Cuz it's literally cardboard inside. It's card, yeah, it's cardboard inside. Yeah. 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 It actually works really well. Yeah. 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 Cuz it's like, it's it's actually like a Can you move the camera? Nope. There you go. Um. Maybe we should get like 